Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Road channel. With all the great sci-fi that's coming out, it is easy to miss stuff, especially if you have favorite authors or if you're into a favorite subgenre such as I am. And we all know what that is. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about a series that's become a cult classic, and I actually hadn't heard of it till a few weeks ago when I saw it mentioned on the sci-fi subreddit. They were speculating on a movie adaptation. Uh, which the author has basically sold the rights to Universal Pictures, which is pretty cool. And it so happened that the first novel in the series was a free promotion on Audible. And so I did that. It was a lot like accepting free crack, <laughs> a free sample of crack, because I was hooked. And uh, the author's universe was so habit-forming that I immediately went through the next two books in the trilogy. Name of the series is Red Rising by Pierce Brown. So the interesting thing about Pierce Brown is that he is young. He got this first thing published at the age of 26, back in 2014, and immediately was so popular that Universal Pictures swooped in and says, let's do a movie deal. Now, it hasn't been done yet, and I'll get back to that a little later. But all I can say is, you know, I'm super jealous. He got great success with the first book. He's just released the sixth, 10 years in, and it's pretty much most of what he's written. I think he's written one other book or, or essay or something like that, at least according to Wikipedia. So I'd like to make this review brief, but I don't know if that's going to be possible because there's a lot to explain, particularly about the premise. And I'll try to avoid spoilers as much as possible, but since this is a first-person narrative, you know that the guy's got to survive because <laughs> you would think they'd have to rename it if, if he died and somebody else had to take over. So, two trilogies, six volumes in all. I've read the first three, uh, and we'll probably end up reading this second three before the end of the year. The first could be considered a YA because uh, the protagonist starts out at age 16, and I think he's only 17 when it ends, but he's continuing to age as the series progresses, so he pretty much gets out of that range. So call it what you want. It's a very exciting, action-packed, and violent series. Start with the premise. It takes place around 700 years in the future, maybe more. Mostly on Mars is where the first book happens, because that's where the protagonist is from, but it expands out to other places later. And it has been terraformed so that people can live on Mars. It's got breathable air and so on, and it's got oceans and you know a tolerable climate, etc. People have been bioengineered for different capabilities, and these races are identified by color and they have become strict social castes. And indeed, they're actually different species because it's been uh, probably arranged on purpose that certain groups can't have children with other groups. Now, the color applies to the irises of the eyes, for sure. And sometimes the hair. And at first, I imagined that there was also a skin tone, like that the blues had blue skin uh, or light blue skin, which would be cool. Could be go from light blue to dark blue, who knows? But later on, it seems like that's not the case. Although, let's just say that they do vary in lightness and darkness. And now, a brief synopsis. The protagonist of the series is Darrow. He's a red miner living underground in Mars. That is, he's part of the red clan, the red caste. And his group bores tunnels into the planet in search for helium-3, which is the nuclear fuel that powers the society. The society is what they call human civilization in the solar system, which is all kind of one political entity, though a rather loose and acrimonious one, as we'll, as we'll get into. Darrow is only 16 when the story opens, yet he's in the most challenging role. He's a hell diver, which means he operates the claw drill. It's a very dangerous piece of equipment that bores into the rock. In, or, in order to look for this helium-3 pockets. And he is recently married to his childhood sweetheart, Eo. 
and she is very sp spirited and uh, feisty, and he is madly in love with her. But they are stuck down there. They are forbidden from visiting the surface. In fact, they think they've been told that the terraforming is not complete, <laughs> which turns out it is. But anyway, Eo is a little bit of a troublemaker, which is one thing I love about her. And she discovers this secret garden uh, that they're forbidden to go to, but she and Darrow sneak off and they're, you know, they're doing what newlyweds are supposed to do <laughs> in this garden and they get caught which is a severe penalty. And they get flogged, publicly flogged uh, on this platform with the videos recording it so that they can be an example uh, for others. And they, they, it's, it's, it's a brutal beating, you know, they're, they're got welts and they have, you know, blood streaming down their backs. And Eo, being very ornery, she is angry. She's so angry that she begins to sing after she's beaten. And this is a song that has been forbidden uh, by the society for whatever reason. We don't know. It's kind of a rebellious song. So she sings this song. They let her do it. And then they sentence her to death because that's the penalty for singing a forbidden song. So happens the arch governor of Mars is there and he says, yes, hang this piece of filth, basically. And he is a gold. It's a completely different cast. It's a different color. He's got golden eyes, he's got golden hair, and all that stuff. You know, Daryl, of course, is heartbroken. They hang his wife, and then the rule is to let them rot, as an example. Well, he's not going to do that, because he loves her. So he cuts her down and buries her, and the penalty for that is death. And so he doesn't care. He wants to die, because his love is dead. Uh, but instead, he doesn't die. They fake his death because there's this rebel group called the Sons of Ares that want to use him as an operative. And as people will think he's dead, perfect situation. Now, Ares, as many of you should know, is the Greek god of war, which is analogous to the Roman god of war, Mars. And they want to free the Reds from domination, from essential slavery is what they're doing. And so they take Darrow to be remade in this secret lab. Um, in fact, this is far in the future, so there's all this biotech. They can engineer people. They can change your body completely. Uh, funny that if this was the present day, they would have talked about sex changes, but they don't. <laughs> so they remake Darrow as a gold. Now, you can do all sorts of things in these labs. You can have wings put on you. You can have horns. You can do all sorts of things. But one thing that's strictly forbidden is to change your cast. So it's like, again, another death penalty type of thing. But they change his eye color to gold and his hair to gold. And they change his skin tone. And they make him taller because golds are on average a foot taller than the reds. Uh, they're one of the tallest casts because since they're in charge, they want to be intimidating. And they are uh, they are stronger than most other people. They are taller. They are better looking. And they are, on average, perhaps more intelligent. But they are also not very principled. <laughs> now, Darrow has to go through all this pain and suffering to become a gold. But they actually do a pretty good job of it, which you know leads to the rest of the story. and his secret life. Now, he is the archetypal heroic protagonist. He overcomes heartbreak and he learns to deal with uh, all this all this trouble. He endures a lot of pain and a lot of very uh, dire struggles. Uh, and he has to control his need for vengeance against this golden arch governor whose name is Augustus. And that's the Augustus family. He sentenced his wife to die without even using her name. To him, she was just filth. She was just an animal. Now, he's adopted this new identity, which, um, stupidly, he calls himself his same first name, Darrow. But his new name is Darrow O. Andromedus. They all have these Latin names because they are modeled on the Roman Empire. Okay? And anyway, his family was one that was mostly wiped out in a spaceship accident in the asteroid belt. They were 
kind of a minor asteroid mining family. So all these clans, these gold clans, they have these huge states and they own planets or they own parts of planets and they have all these slaves and all these other colors are underneath them. So Daryl is inserted into this contest at the Institute. Now that's the institution that selects future leaders for gold society. And it's not just, you know, a difficult thing. It's not just like Hogwarts. It is more like the Hunger Games because a lot of the challenges are kill or be killed. In this case, they have 100 students from all these upper families of gold. And they are put in this big rural area in uh, southern Mars where they have all these castles and things and rivers and, and, and hills and wildlife, you know, including wolves, and they're supposed to triumph. You know, one person is supposed to become the winner. He's going to get the most valued, the most coveted role in society. But out of the hundred that they bring in, at least 50 will die because the first challenge is to kill your opponent. And poor Darrow, who is a good guy, uh, he, you know, wants to do the right thing. He immediately has to kill this fellow teenager who is um, a likable fellow. He's a sensitive and smart guy that would have been a friend of Darrow's in another life. So that's something that haunts him for the rest of his days <laughs> to, you know, give a little bit of a, a spoiler there. A very brutal uh, challenge. And they've got all this stuff goes on, um, including, you know, murder <laughs> and betrayal and, and all these things so it's pretty exciting a lot of great action red rising is a great series in many ways first the impressive world building the society as i mentioned has terraformed most of the worlds in the solar system the ones that are practical to do so you know like mars and venus and uh, the big moons of jupiter our own moon uh titan uh, in the saturn system etc and a lot of the asteroids are filled with colonies, you know, inside colonies. You know, years ago, these engineered races that had moved out in space, they turn on Earth and they conquer Earth and, and subjugate it to their will. So the actual seat of the society, the seat of the empire, as you will, is our moon, Luna. And the ruler is called the Sovereign. And, and she is a woman named Octavia who killed her father to take his place. He was a tyrant, so nobody regretted it too much, but she's a tyrant too. <laughs> they have all these families which are kind of autonomous, but they all have to bow to the sovereign, who is not considered an emperor. She's just considered first among equals. And now, speaking of colors, because there are these various colors, gold being at the top, uh, I counted 14. And they include gold, copper, and silver. They're at the top. I think silver administrators, copper, I think, might be accountants. I don't remember. There's the six colors of the rainbow, with um, red being at the bottom as laborers. Plus, there's white, gray, pink, and brown. And instead of black, obsidian. Now, I'm thinking that maybe the publisher said, no, you can't use black. Sorry. <laughs> Too politically risky. And by the way, obsidians are not black in anything but their eye iris color. Uh, they have white hair, and their culture is based on the Vikings. They are the, the fiercest warriors of the society. And so each of these castes has a role, as they did in the Latter-day Roman Empire, where you were actually stuck in your job, you know, inherited your job from your father. Again, silvers are high-level administrators. Yellows are healers. Blues are technicians. Grays are police, pink are sex workers, violet are the creatives, and uh, so on. And the noble families all have Latin-sounding names, and they all jockey for power. A lot of backstabbing, a lot of assassinations, poisonings, uh, and duels. The interesting thing, the odd thing, is that unlike the Roman Empire, it's completely, it's very egalitarian as far as sex is concerned. There are a lot of women in high places. There are a lot of women in the military. There's also a bit of a British Empire vibe to it, with the lords and ladies sounding kind of like the upper crust Brits of the Victorian era. They're following similar pursuits, like 
art, hunting, soldiering, etc. A lot of the banter sounds very much like that high-class British stuff. Uh, for example, the term bloody is reserved for the lower classes. It's a rude term in Britain, what I understand. It's the highborn say gory instead. So the, the uh, low guys might say bloody damn, and the highborn will say gory hell. The first book, Red Rising, establishes Darrow's situation and gives him the motivation for revenge against the death of his wife, for freedom for his people. And he needs to earn a place in the royal families. The higher the family, the more effectively he'll be able to subvert the society and help his people overcome them. His personal target is, of course, the House of Augustus, the clan of the Martian arch governor who sentenced Eo to death. Now, at the Ea Institute, where he has to earn his place, as I said, there's lots of horrific violence and uh, backstabbing and murder. This is not a book for the faint hearted. Although there is some sex, uh, there is lots more violence. This brings me to another great feature of these books, which is the characters. Many of the characters are those who survived the Institute with Daryl. And this is where their experiences earn them powerful nicknames. Daryl's is the Reaper. This is because. You know, he was brash and willing to kill if he had to. And his weapon of choice was a sling blade, which coincidentally he used as a miner. It was to, for emergency, to free yourself from, you know, being trapped, even if it meant cutting off your limbs. So he's a tough character. He really is. Although he's also sensitive. Now, another of his classmates, one of my personal favorite characters, is the arch governor's daughter. Of course, of course. Uh, and his love interest, and his her name is Virginia, but her nickname is Mustang. What a cool name. And she is a lover of horses, a very avid horsewoman. Of course, they have horses on Mars, of course. And she has a spirited personality, much like a, you know, a feisty filly, you know, as people sometimes describe her as. Her twin brother is um, also at the Institute, I think, what is his name, Antonius? I may be remembering that wrong. He's her polar opposite, whereas she is is noble and good, even though, of course, she had to kill to survive. Uh, she's essentially a good person, whereas he is a psychopath. And he is the guy who was eating people <laughs> in the Institute because they were under siege in his castle. And, uh, you know, if anybody died, well, we're out of food, so let's just eat them. The Jackal, as they call the brother, good name for him, despite the Jackal's complete lack of any sort of human decency, Daryl is conspiring with him because the Jackal is ruthless and he's hoping he can use him to help further his own causes. Now, a couple other great characters. There are so many, but I'll have two more. One, one of them is Severo, who is called Goblin because he's rather short, probably only six foot, and he's ugly, uh, but he's brash, and he is the leader of a band of crazies called the Howlers, because they have wolves on Mars, and so what they did was they skinned the wolves and wore their pelts, <laughs> and uh, so he's their leader. Another great character is the wisecracking earthborn legionnaire Holiday T. Nakamura. And she's a badass chick, <laughs> as they would call her. I wish she'd been given more of a role. Um, but unfortunately, you can only do so much. Second book is called Golden Sun, spelled S-O-N. I assume that's Darrow. After the Institute, he goes into the Academy so he can become a space commander. Uh, what is it? Like a Praetor? All right, forget all these titles. But he basically wants to be in command of his own legion. And... In these battles, they're using real spaceships, and they are actually destroying the spaceships and essentially killing each other. The only thing that's off-bound is nukes. So he survives that, and he goes to work for his girlfriend's daddy and his wife's murderer, Augustus. But the rumor is that Augustus likes him so much uh, because his own son is a psychopath, and his daughter, well, she's a girl, so he'd rather not leave the planet to her that Daryl might be his adopted heir. And so that, of course, brings a lot of people that are going to be conspiring against him, to ruin him, to find out his secrets. 
And as we'd expect, Daryl finds himself in deep, deep trouble by the end of the book. I'm not going to say more than that. Well, not much more. This is a little bit of a spoiler because we have to find out how the next book starts. Third book is called Morning Star, and which sees Daryl being freed from a year-long torture and imprisonment at the hands of who? The Jackal, of course. And in that time, you know, people thought he was dead, but he was the like a martyr to the resistance movement. And in a very reckless gesture, Daryl's ally Severo reveals Daryl's true identity as a red who was made into gold. So that kind of tips his hands so he can't you know, pretend to be gold anymore. Even when he's released, he has to be outside the law. Well, luckily, too, Mustang has escaped. Now, her role is questionable. Are they going to get along now that she knows that he's a liar and a fraud? You know, can she accept that? Some of his allies can't. So it kind of takes a different direction because they decide they need powerful allies, and their powerful allies are going to be the Obsidians, who are these Viking warriors that live in Mars's poles. They've been banished because they rose up against the Golds 200 years ago. So the question is, can Darrow uh, recruit these Obsidians successfully? Can he lead them to victory over Augustus and the Jackal? and uh, the evil tyrant Octavia, or will they be slaughtered and re-enslaved? Good question. You have to do this book to find out. What else do I love about this series? First of all, there's exciting action, including fights to death, swords, sword battles, and so on, rescues, uh, space battles, last-minute saves. <laughs> there are cliffhangers. There are clever schemes to get Darrow out of trouble, and he's pretty smart. He thinks of all these really audacious plans. He's kind of, you know, a brinksman. Brinksmanship? What do they call that? Anyway, he's the kind of guy who would ram a spaceship to win a battle, even if it's going to possibly kill him himself. I love the narrator, who is pretty amazing, Tim Gerard Reynolds. He has the greatest voices. He starts out with a thick Irish brogue because all the Reds, they sound like they're Irish. As it progresses, Darrow's voice becomes more cultured and a little less coarse. And of course, he reads the normal golds as upper-class Brits. And there are even, you know, there are other accents like the Obsidians and even the Earthers. They sound like Americans. I, uh, Love the way that they can kill off major characters. So you can't really know that anybody except Daryl is going to survive. And even him, you know, they could, they could carry on this the series with somebody else as the lead. You never know. Uh, I love the way they howl. <laughs> oh, it's part of their battle cry. And they have some good catchphrases. But, uh, but those are mainly stuff that the characters say that's kind of cool. Can't think of any at the moment. There's one character named Quicksilver who is an actual libertarian, pretty much. He's a businessman who just wants to get the government off his back. So he backs the rebellion and secretly helps them. And he also, also happens to be openly gay. He's one of the few gay characters in this book. I suppose Pierce figured, yeah, I better include one. <laughs> uh, so disadvantages, there are a few. First of all, the first person narrative does limit you to some degree, although Personally, I wrote two books in first person, <laughs> so I can't talk. Uh, he uses present tense, which I don't like. I don't like, you know, I, I go to him and I say, and to me, that's for joke telling. That's not for a novel, but you get used to it. It's very violent. If you're sensitive, you don't want to read or listen to this book. Now, the equality between the sexes seems a little odd in this very militaristic and authoritarian society, but... I guess you can consider that they've engineered people. Women can be stronger than they are in real life. And sometimes the characters talk too much during a tense situation. You say, oh my God, the enemy's on his way. Stop bickering or stop trying to, you know, make your friend feel better about himself. Just get the heck out of there. Finally, Mustang. She's not quite flawed enough for my taste. I mean, you can't help if you're a heterosexual dude. You can't help but fall in love with her. I mean, you're as, as in love with Mustang as Darrow is. And you say, maybe she should be a little bit more of a bitch. 
<laughs> she is a bit of one, but maybe a little bit more. So he's got more of a of a dilemma. The only reason he wants to push her away is to protect her, which is just too freaking noble. There it is. Wonderful series. Great fun. Amazing. Hope it's made into a movie. Now, I was going to come back to this, and I am. Why haven't they made it into a movie? Ten years ago, they optioned it. It seems like at about that time, this happened a lot. There were a lot of movies that were options that were not made. A lot of steampunk stuff that never got made. Now, this was about the time that a lot of lefties started saying, steampunk is racist because it celebrates colonialism. Not true, but, you know, they figured it didn't support the message, as Critical Drinker would say. You know, because even though Red Rising is about a rebellion against tyranny... It's not very specific. It could be anybody's rebellion against any kind of tyranny. Anybody can relate to it, you know, whether you're a libertarian or a lefty or a right winger. That's my theory. That's why I think they haven't done it. It just doesn't check the right boxes. And, you know, the author's a young white guy. <laughs> so maybe soon. Let's hope so. So this has been my review of the amazing, exciting, and very violent <laughs> Red Rising series, the first trilogy by Pierce Brown, and there are three more that have been produced, and one I think just came out this year or last year, and he's got a seventh one planned, believe it or not. And so let me know what you think in the comments. Please like and subscribe, and please check out my books on Amazon. Links are in the description. For now, this is the Steampunk Test Row saying, adios amigos, the Steampunk Test Row channel where the past meets the future, and the present is extraordinary.